completed her PhD in African Diaspora Studies at the University of California, Berkeley in 2010. She's a brand new PhD. <laughs> her dissertation was titled Representations of Race, Entanglements of Power, Whiteness, Garveyism, and Redemptive Geographies in Costa Rica, 1921 to 1950. It explores the making and contestation of racial identity and West Indian belonging in the white identified Central American nation. She's currently a professor of social science and practice, in practice, um, postdoctoral fellow and visiting assistant professor in African American studies and history at UCLA. Dr. Lees teaches courses on black nationalism and internationalism before 1950, as well as the politics of womanhood in the African diaspora. Melissa Stein has a history with this um, project. She was one of our um, graduate student assistants in the very, very beginning, and she also helped to write an extensive grant proposal. She's worked with us from the beginning, so it's really wonderful to have her here today. She received her PhD from Rutgers University Department of History in New Brunswick, um, New Jersey. Uh, she has currently been at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and she just told me that, what, just about a week ago or 10 days ago, maybe? Uh, yeah, yeah, like that. yeah, very recently, um, she received a tenure track position um, at the University of Kentucky in Women's and Gender Studies, so. So those are our two panelists, and our, um, our, my, our respondent is going to, um, the Mabala Somoharo, who, as I said, is one of our um, participants in the workshop. Thank you very much. Um, and what I'm going to share um, are some snapshots from an article um, in progress. So it's a work in progress. Um, and my work, uh, in general, looks at Garveyism and black women's theorizing in Costa Rica. But I do um, employ a transnational frame of analysis, so I'll move between um, uh, varying spaces uh, in Limon, Costa Rica, and also in the larger transnational Garveyite community. And so I think about this uh, issue of circulation. I take it very seriously. Um, and so the title of the article I'm working on is um, toward the, quote, higher type of womanhood, the gendered contours of Garveyism and the making of redemptive diaspora in Costa Rica, 1922 to 1940, a little different from what's in your um, program. In her 1922 message for the Negro women of the world that appeared in Marcus Garvey's Negro World newspaper, the lady president of the Philadelphia division of the UNIA, or Universal Negro Improvement Association, declared that, quote, the redemption of Africa depends on the motherhood of black women. Redemption, a term central to and often invoked in Garveyite rhetoric, was a striving toward the liberation of both continental Africans from European colonization and of persons of African descent in the Americas from disenfranchisement, marginalization, and racial terror. Garveyism was a diasporic cultural and political ideology dependent on the making of new black subjectivities, a rewriting of African history, and a particular type of black womanhood. This redemptive womanhood, um, uh, in the opinion of Garveyites, was enacted through intellectual pursuits and activities that would derail bodily and sexual quote unquote, deviance. Through respectable behavior, especially in public spaces, and in mothering the race through the biological and social reproduction of, of a redeemed black identity. Black motherhood and womanhood were central preoccupations in the Negro World newspaper, which circulated throughout the transnational Garveyite community. Through engaging with, contributing to, and producing their own Garveyite mediascapes, West Indians in the Atlantic coastal region of Limon, Costa Rica, crafted redemptive identities in conversation with um, Garveyites in other parts of the African diaspora. And I use this term West Indians to refer to the English-speaking immigrants of African descent from the British West Indies, primarily Jamaica, and their offspring. And West Indians had come to Costa Rica as migrant labor um, on railroad and port construction projects in the late 19th century, and then most, noted, no, most notably as workers on United Fruit Company plantations at the turn of the 20th century. The banana boom peaked in 1910, and around 20,000 West Indians had made their way to Costa Rica. By the 1920s, however, the population declined as the banana business suffered uh, in the midst of plant disease and economic depression. Those who stayed in Costa Rica 
those West Indians, rather, who stayed in Costa Rica through the 1920s and 1930s and onward, desired permanence, but would not be granted citizenship until 1949, even though some had been born in Costa Rica. My research, therefore, chronicles a period in flux, as West Indians were no longer fully British Caribbean and were not yet Costa Rican. For many Costa Rican nationalists in the 1920s and 1930s, the official white identity of the nation, based on a narrative of history that heralds the Spanish ancestry of Costa Ricans, justified the denial of West Indian citizenship and the enactment of laws of racial segregation. So while examining uh, the, the gendered contours of Garveyism um, and the politics of womanhood among Garveyites, um, my article also highlights the central role of newspapers in the negotiation of nation and diaspora, as West Indians claimed belonging to both Costa Rica and to the African diaspora. Um, there were two Limon-based newspapers published at the time, which I'll uh, be referring to. The Limon Searchlight was a West Indian weekly with a Garveyite editor. In fact, he was a former UNIA branch president um, in Costa Rica. And the Spanish language uh, Voz del Atlantico, or Atlantic Voice, um, which f featured West Indian columnists in the English language section. And of course, West Indians in Limon subscribed and submitted news to the Harlem, New York-based Negro world. Amy Jakes Garvey, uh, second wife of Garvey, introduced the Our Women and What They Think page in the Negro world in 1924. She believed that newspaper, the newspaper was an important vehicle for women to communicate with each other. And as Eula Taylor's work reveals, Jakes Garvey identified the sharing of ideas, theorizing, as a form of activism. For Jakes Garvey, the reconceptualization of a woman's place was central to black uplift and redemption. Women had, quote, overstepped the home boundary and are serving all humanity, read one headline in her section. For Garveyite women in Harlem, Limon, and elsewhere, racial improvement required what they termed, quote, the higher type of womanhood. And this is one that countered dominant representations of black women and challenged hegemonic constructions of both race and gender. And the UNIA, um, just to zoom back into Costa Rica, was the central organizing factor in the West Indian community, with 23 branches spread over the province of Limon. West Indians appropriated, adapted, and translated the ideology of Garveyism to suit the local context of Limon. The cover of the UNIA membership card in Limon in the early 1920s outlined the efforts of the organization as, quote, striving for the freedom, manhood, and nationalism of the Negro to hand down to posterity a flag of empire. The UNIA perceived its struggle against marginalization and powerlessness as a struggle against the feminization of the race. And the making of a black nation and empire was therefore an affirmation of black manhood. Equating freedom and power with manhood, the strength of a redeeming diaspora would enable blacks to, in the words of Marcus Garvey, measure up in this world of men. But as Barbara Baer notes in her influential work on gender and the Garvey movement, while some women accepted the gender roles that were implicit in Garveyism, others rebelled against them. In her words, creating modified positions of authority for themselves and reconstructing prevailing views of womanhood and manhood in the process. For Costa Rican nationalists who believed in the superiority of whiteness and the goal of white purity in the nation, however, uh, black female sexuality and what they thought of as black female sexual immorality was thought to be the basis of the degeneracy of blacks in general. A 1933 letter to Congress signed by 500 Costa Rican workers in Limon petitioned against the continued residence and employment of West Indians within the country since, quote, it is not possible to get along with the blacks because their bad morals don't permit it. For them, the family does not exist, nor does female honor. And for this reason, they live in an overcrowding and promiscuity that is dangerous for our homes, founded in accordance with the precepts of religion and the good morals of the Costa Ricans." Unquote. So for the petitioners, black women were the primary cause of black degeneracy since this purported preponderance of uh, promiscuity amongst West, among West Indians was the result of the lack of female honor and quote unquote normal home and familial relationships which were conceived as a woman's sphere of influence. Defining blackness as devoid of morality, specifically sexual morality, the 500 workers that signed the petition employed the same logic as whites in the US who used lynching to govern racial borders. Integration was perceived as a sexual threat. 
the Costa Rican Congress enacted laws that sought to restrict black naturalization, black movement and employment within the nation, and the overall integration of black residents into the national body. Uh, the 1934 banana contract, for instance, banned black workers from a new banana zone created in the, on the Pacific side of the country. Um, and other laws of racial segregation um, were proposed, and some were, in fact, passed into law. So conditions in Costa Rica and the world at large made the Garveyite call for unification an appealing one. News of lynchings and race riots in the United States, the US occupation of Haiti, um, the Italian invasion of Abyssinia in 1938, circulated, the news of all this circulated in Limon via the Negro world and the local West Indian newspapers and helped to shape the contours of a black world. Redemptive diaspora was then a striving toward racial unity with the idea that the development of racial strength among blacks would protect them from discrimination and exclusion wherever they found themselves in the world. Quote, any race or people who do not nationalize themselves are doomed to extinction a searchlight edit, uh, contributor wrote, the survival and future of the race was at stake as, as, quote, those legislations against the Negro is with a view to exterminate him, unquote. So this issue of racial survival then gets entangled with um, the Garveyite uh, uh, production of what they see as redemptive black womanhood. The sexuality of women was both at stake in and the vehicle of racial redemption, and the home was a site of racial reproduction. Since redemptive motherhood produced redemptive citizens and nations, women as mothers shouldered the, bur the burden of birthing a diasporic race. Ruth uh, Feldstein identifies what she calls maternal ideologies as governed by the logic that women who failed as mothers were objects of concern because they raised men who failed to meet the criteria, criteria of healthy citizenship. Garveyites echoed this belief that black women's bodies and behavior required regulation for race relations to improve. So UNIA women's definitions of redemption um, highlight an interesting intersection between patriarchal and feminist ideas. Making a redemptive diaspora required a break with the cults of true womanhood that restricted women to the domestic and private sphere. So on the one hand, Garveyite women encouraged and emphasized their maternal roles, but at the same time they believed that uh, nurturing leadership traits allowed women to run not only their homes efficiently, but also their communities and nations. Proclaim proclaiming that, quote, it is the babies in the cradle who will be the true Garveyites of tomorrow, unquote, Garveyite women appointed themselves as the guarantors of the future of black redemption. Um, and there was, there's a lot in uh, both uh, the Limon papers and the Negro world dealing with sort of how black redemptive mothers are role models teaching children uh, to uh, value and love their race and history. And this question of race pride, um, I saw a lot, the, this term race pride. A Searchlight article claimed that evolution, using the word, uh, the term from the article, was the result of racial purity and urged blacks to, quote, be proud of those characteristics which made make them a separate and distinct type, since pride of race alone is a safeguard to racial purity. In an environment in which black integration and citizenship in Costa Rica was viewed as a threat to the purported racial purity of the nation, West Indians utilized Garveyite discourse of race pride as a critique to the representations of black sexual desire for whites that underscored fears of miscegenation. Although often characterized as the perpetuators of, of sexual, uh, quote unquote, indecency, young women, West Indian women were also portrayed as the key to black success and integration within Costa Rican society. The UNIA informed the making of women's auxiliary clubs in the 1930s that specifically targeted young women and urged, quote, unquote, intellectual encouragement, um, to use one of their terms, as the solution to the crisis, the purported crisis of black womanhood in Limon. So activities like elocution contests, debates, and weekly lectures were aimed at stimulating the minds of West Indian women and therefore rerouting their seemingly innate bodily desires toward transgressive behavior. The Young Women's Standard Club sought to, quote, subdue the darker passions and reclaim those who might have erred, unquote. The hope was that these clubs and activities would keep young women occupied by physical and mental activities 
in hopes that the, this would deter their becoming what uh, Garveyite West Indian women and in, uh, Garveyite West Indians in Limon saw as a negative type of public woman, whether as sex workers, participants in interracial relationships, or as loud talking, quote unquote, vulgar fixtures on the streets. And there was a lot of reflection about uh, women's behaviors um, on, uh, in public, loudness, etc. Lots of reflections on that in the Limon searchlight. So these clubs reaffirmed the divisions and hierarchies between UNIA West Indians and those on the outside of the redemptive community. The making of redemptive blackness through the representation of black womanhood sought to showcase respectable young women as examples of the true nature of black women at large. Women who deviated from this model had also deviated from what it meant to be authentically black in the minds of Garveyites. The exclusion of certain parts of the West Indian community and the heralding of specific types of women were part and parcel then of the project of redemption. According to E. Patrick Johnson, blackness does not belong to any one group. Rather, in his words, individuals or groups appropriate this complex and nuanced racial signifier in order to circumscribe its boundaries. In her Searchlight column series, Philomela's Friendly Talk with Girls, published in the early 1930s, uh, writer Philomela argued that young women had a central role in the uplift of West Indians in Costa Rica, defining redemption within the social and political landscape of Limon. While affirming patriarchal control over women's sexuality on the one hand, Philomela also sought to empower West Indian women to take control over their destinies, to set goals, and to penetrate glass ceilings. The educational success and social progress of black women would raise the standard of life in the province at large in Philomela's view. Quote, better yourself, well, better your situation for a better limon, she instructed young women. With the right aims, Philomela envisioned UNIA and other club women as a part of a vanguard that would help to improve the position of West Indians within Costa Rican society and would make limon better and cleaner by their example, quote, in her, in her words. In conclusion, the Limon Searchlight and the Negro World offered alternative images of black womanhood and femininity. As Bell Hooks argues, issues of representation are linked with the issue of documentation. And Garveyites put their self-representations on the record via these newspapers. The interdependence of writing and racism and white supremacy and the text rendered the West Indian newspaper a key site of counter-narration. For blacks, written out of history and caricatured as non-human, then textual power becomes a route to freedom and bodily autonomy. In many ways, Garvey redemption was complementary to white Costa Rican nationalism, particularly in the realm of gender and respectability, ideals of racial purity, and the truth of race. The logic of redemption, however, would motivate West Indians to push for citizenship and equal rights in Costa Rica. And this was a challenge to dominant narratives and terrains of Costa Rican nationhood. Garveyism encouraged the civic participation and self-determination of West Indians in Costa Rica and their critiques of dominant definitions of blackness, informing the discourses upon which West Indians claimed rights of citizenship and began to make Afro-Costa Rican identities. Women's theorizing, especially Pan-African and diasporic theorizing, in my opinion, is often left out of discussions of West Indian thought and Caribbean intellectual history in the interwar period. Perhaps closer analysis of black newspapers can help us to think about how black women's theorizing shaped the meanings of both diaspora and womanhood. Well-known UNIA leaders like Amy Jakes Garvey, along with lesser-known local writers like Philomela and various other unknown women contributors to Garveyite mediascapes, produced a transnational sphere in which women, uh, on the one hand, challenged and other times reaffirmed gender norms. In an environment shaped in the entanglements of US empire, the exportation of bananas, legacies of plantation slavery, and anti-black nationalism in Latin America, Garveyite women and men constructed redemptive diaspora in Limon as a strategy of survival in the face of dehumanization, exclusion, and placelessness. Thank you. Um, thank you to the uh, conference organizers, and I am very excited to be back here on the other side of the project um, now that uh, my second book project um, fits in nicely with the themes. Um, 
so a few words on my first project, just by way of um, setting up how I came to this topic. Um, my, my first project, my dissertation project, is on gender and scientific racism. Um, so dealing with a lot of the, the kind of um, dominant discourse um, on, on race um, and gender difference um, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, and to some extent um, responses by black ethnologists who were um, primarily male. Um, but as I worked on the project, um, I always had in the back of my head um, this kind of question about how black women, um, who were often at the nexus of these um, discourses of biological determinism on the basis of both gender and race, um, how they conceptualized these categories themselves. Um, what, what might it look like if we flipped the lens around um, and looked at them not as the objects of racial science, but as um, the subjects of theorizing themselves. Um, in particular um, black female scientists and medical professionals. Um, and yet, at the same time, in kind of developing this, um, this second book project, um, which you know is very much in the early stages of development, um, so I'm, I'm kind of asking myself methodological questions um, and you know, raising methodological concerns. And I'm very keenly aware of um, Darlene Clark Hines' um, um, you know, questions that she raises about getting to the inner lives of black women in the Jim, in the Jim Crow era and how, um, how challenging that is um, in the kind of culture of dissemblance that she describes in which black women were constrained in terms of what they talked about publicly, um, especially around issues like race and gender. Um, but my starting supposition is still that it's um, it's a story worth telling, even if the um, even if there are these methodological challenges. Um, so I, I'm kind of at the point of um, looking at um, how I might think about my source sets um, as of, as I'm going through all this research. Um, how might we get at the inner lives of Black women in um, the Jim Crow period, particularly in medical and scientific. Um, scientific professions, um, which these women are more likely to be, um, you know, uh, um, more likely to be published. They're more likely to have left a written record um, that we can get at, and yet they're still facing the same kind of challenges of speaking publicly um, in an era in which um, they are representing the race. Um, they there are constantly character. Um, you know, um, they constantly have to defend their character by the very fact that they are women in public um, in, male, in fields that are traditionally defined as male. Um, so with that kind of set up, um, let me give um, an example of some of the things that I'm looking at. So in 1926, um, Hallie Quinn Brown, herself an accomplished educator, international lecturer, and reformer who held a Bachelor of Science degree from Wilberforce University and was the daughter of two former slaves, um, published a biographical compendium entitled Homespun Heroes and Other Women of Distinction. Among the 60 uh, African-American women whose lives Brown chronicled therein, she reserved some of her most effusive praise for Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, the first black woman to practice medicine professionally in New York, and only the third in the nation. Born in 1847, McKinney Stewart opened a Brooklyn medical practice in 1870, which ultimately went on to serve a clientele that crossed both race and gender lines and won her widespread respect. Um, and in fact, um, Du Bois um, gave the eulogy at her funeral um, in the early 19th century. Um, she found professional success at a time in which, as um, Hallie Brown herself pointed out, many feared that a woman who worked outside of the home, particularly in a traditionally male field like medicine, would, quote, unsex herself, end quote. Um, but McKinney Stewart not only fa faced an ethos of biological determinism that cast doubt on women's abilities and served to justify the all too tangible restrictions um, placed on their educational and professional opportunities, she faced similar issues on account of her race, having lived and worked in the heyday of scientific racism. 
at a time in which the mental capacities um, and moral, moral character of African American women were constantly attacked in both medical scientific and popular discourse, Hallie Quinn Brown noted that McKinney Stewart's life story quote, is ample refutation of vile slanders um, that, like deadly um, branches, have again and again cast blighting shadows over the contingent of American women with whom she was identified by race extraction, end quote. Hallie Quinn Brown attempted to imagine what might have motivated the storied physician, deceased by the time of Brown's writing, to enter the field of medicine. In doing so, Brown narrated McKinney Stewart's possible inner thoughts um, in terms that both conformed to gender tropes about women's nature and challenged gender inequalities. Speculating that she was driven, to, driven by a need to nurture and heal through her experience caring for several sick and injured um, siblings during the Civil War and prior. Brown simultaneously praised her for bucking gender conventions and defended her character as a woman and as a black woman specifically. Brown remarked, quote, to our women, the colored women of America, her eloquent though mute advice is to take stock of resources available and limitations that restrict, learn to distinguish between proper ambitions and sordid greed cultivate a desire for a full life, one of selection and expansion to the limit, keeping, over, um, keeping ever inviolate the purity and prestige of womanhood, glorify the life individual, and claim scope for that free development which is the birthright of every human being." End quote. Brown's characterization of McKinney Stewart as, quote, eloquent though mute, um, end quote, speaking through example rather than words, suggests a methodological challenge for historians in writing about the inner lives of African American women, particularly the intellectual history of black women in medical and scientific fields during the Jim Crow period, um, when they were not terribly numerous, um, and their pro um, professional writings were constrained by the gender and racial politics of the era, and their private writings often sparse with their professional responsibilities placing so many dem demands on their time. Um, so in other words, unlike a lot of the kind of white male um, medical and scientific pro um, professionals during the same era um, who often recorded, who often wrote autobiographies and memoirs that can really only be described um, as vanity pieces. I've, I've read several of them, um, and um, <laughs> they're often quite exhaustive, um, and um, um, yeah, vanity pieces works. Um, uh, we often don't have the same kind of, um, the same kind of writings from black women in medical and scientific professions. Um, Still, um, at a time um, in which black women were so frequently the object of medical scientific ideologies that sought to naturalize racial and gender difference and hierarchy, recovering the intellectual subjecthood of African American women within those very professions prom um, is especially important, not only for understanding how these women envision their own role in challenging biological determinism and structural inequalities, but also for fleshing out um, a more nuanced dynamic picture of racial thought in the Jim Crow period. Um, in other words, a lot of um, the women um, that I have read, their um, personal accounts, a lot of um, black female scientists were keenly aware of um, of, them, of themselves as a um, role model in the way that Hallie Brown um, described um, McKinney Stewart, that she, you know, that they were keenly aware of um, the eyes being on them um, as, um, as kind of character role models as well as professional role models. Um, however, Susan McKinney Stewart was not actually mute within her lifetime. Her split roles as wife, mother, um, twice widowed, um, a physician, and active volunteer in a, um, in a variety of charitable endeavors geared toward the post-emancipation project of racial uplift may not have afforded her the time to write her own memoir or biography. Um, and the racial politics of respectability surely constrained what she said publicly in many ways. But she was not silent. 
Um, instead, she underscores the, um, the challenge facing scholars interrogating black women's intellectual history in this period um, that um, involves thinking more broadly about the types of primary source materials one uses and how one might read more traditional sources such as public speeches in new ways to uncover the in inner lives and racial and, and gendered thought of the speakers. For example, um, in a title entitled, uh, in a paper entitled Women in Medicine, which she presented before a meeting of the National um, Association of, um, of Colored Women's Clubs in 1914, McKinney Stewart traced the laudable history of um, women in medical fields more generally um, in a project not unlike um, the one in which um, Hallie Brown included her description of of um, McKinney Stewart. Um, she then zeroed in on black women specifically, remarking that they stood um, as a, quote, distinguished credit to our race, end quote, and, quote, measured up um, in every way with their white female peers. Um, but a close reading of her commentary um, elsewhere in the speech suggests that while she gave little credence to any meaningful difference between the races, she hinged her claims to being a successful and compassionate medical professional on more conventional notions of gender difference, um, at least outwardly. Um, in other words, the specificity of women's nature, as she referred to it, um, is what made her a good doctor. Um, women, um, she noted, are amply trained in matters of the heart, end quote. Um, my paper, then, is concerned uh, with the ways in which historians might uncover how black women themselves conceptualized race and gender professionally and privately during the Jim Crow period. Um, and since black women stood at the nexus of powerful scientific discourses of biological determinism, how did black female scientists and physicians specifically describe um, bodies, um, the abstract bodies that personified racial and sex difference in biomedical science, as well as their own um, physicality, during a period in which their very professional existence stood as a challenge to theories about the capacities of women and African Americans? Um, and she's not alone um, in, in the um, kind of interviews and oral histories that I have read with black female scientists um, in the early 20th century in kind of um, talking about um, women's nature as actually making them better scientists, um, even as they kind of reject um, any difference between themselves and white female scientists. Um, they, they'll kind of employ um, a biological um, notion of what, um, about the specific nature of being female that makes them perhaps better scientists than men. Um, one, one example um, that I read was a woman um, talking about, um, a black woman talking about becoming an engineer in the um, 1930s and um, being, despite having um, a very, a very good professional training, being rejected from a number of jobs on account of um, several employers say, said that she was not, as a woman, going to be strong enough, um, physically strong enough um, um, to do some of the work required of her. And she countered with um, the fact that um, um, her female body um, afforded her very small hands that would make her particularly adept at working with the kind of equipment they required of her. Um, so kind of in, um, drawing on um, a notion of kind of sex difference, but also inverting it um, to her benefit as well. Um, so the debate over racial um, ca um, capacities and destinies in the late 19th and early 20th centuries is typically described as one defined entirely by men. Certainly, black women featured symbolically in scientific racism during this period, but were rarely, if ever, seen as in intellectual subjects shaping the terms of scientific inquiry on racial matters. But is that really where the story ends? Um, while there's been a very rich scholarship tracing black women's um, entry into medical and scientific professions um, during this period, much of this work has been done from a social history perspective. Um, in other words, how race and gender provided uh, or um, created professional obstacles um, into um, their entry into these fields that they had to then over overcome um, through professional organizations and so on. Um, 
in contrast, using a variety of sources from um, published interviews to professional writings, um, my larger project um, from which this paper derives um, examines black women's um, scientific thought on race and gender within the changing socio-political context of the nation, but also in light of the cultural politics of medical scientific practice. Um, consequently, this paper also interrogates the extent to which black, women, black female scientists and physicians were both a part of and a part from larger intellectual trends among black women outside the medical scientific establishment because of their confluence of racial, gender, and professional identities. Thank you. Okay, I want to um, introduce in a more thorough way, our respondent, who is um, Professor Mabala Somaharo, who teaches, um, is currently a professor of English at the University of Tours in France, from which she also received her PhD. Some of you might be familiar with her. She taught at Barnard and at Columbia, was a research fellow at the Institute for Research in African American Studies. Her dissertation was a comparative analysis of early ideologies of the nation of Islam and Rastafarianism. Um, and she's currently working on um, the history of African Im immigrants in the Bronx. For our project, she's writing a really exquisite piece on um, the thought of, the historical thought of um, the novelist Maurice Conde. So she'll provide comments. Mm -hmm. So I'll try to, uh, good afternoon everyone, sorry. Uh, I try to tie uh, the two papers, mm -hmm. like what I got from uh, Melissa's mm -hmm. uh, paper that I didn't get to read uh, beforehand. But I think as the, um, that I see as the underlying theme, uh, that of negotiation for both papers. Uh, in the case of Melissa, we are looking at women and this particular woman in the early 20th century entering the medical world, uh, this unexpected site for black women, for black people mm -hmm. and black women in, in particular. And she, um, th this, um, the person you've described is trying to uh, and reify the black woman that is uh, going uh, using the dynamics to go from being the object to being the subject as you indicated in uh, in your title. Mm -hmm. So that's that's um, how I see what I see in the paper. And I'm sorry I cannot say more for today. But when it comes to uh, Garvey and UNIA in Costa Rica, I was particularly attracted to uh, the site that uh, Asia has chosen to, um, to, to study. Uh, many works and I mean, many books and many articles that have been devoted to Garvey have mainly focused on uh, the USA mm -hmm. and in the urban centers of the USA. So even more work needs to be done in the, in, in the uh, rural south, for instance, but even more work needs to be carried out in uh, Costa Rica and uh, in uh, Sp Spanish speaking. Uh, um, places that might be what the uh, where the divide comes from the, the the problem of the language, right? So I think that what was interesting in in what you presented in your paper was the concept of placelessness and the, the fact that uh, the the population that you're looking at in the early 20th century, those West Indians and particularly Jamaicans who have migrated from Jamaica to Costa Rica, finds them find themselves at a certain point is um, in and in between. They are no longer subjects of uh, the, the British colonial empire, and they are fighting for uh, you know, citizenship rights within uh, Costa Rica. So that really uh, led me to think about this, um, the notion of diaspora itself, and how this, um, uh, these West Indians uh, who had relocated in, uh, in, in Costa Rica were in between, meaning that they had been, if you take the diaspora and, and, and if you place the African continent as the, 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 the you know, the um, point of departure, mm -hmm. uh, they have again departed from another uh, place uh, where they had arrived, namely Jamaica, to find themselves in, in a place where they, they, they don't belong yet, right? And I think that goes, um, I think that it is interesting because lately people have spoken, and I'm thinking about Kim Butler, for instance, of the um, circulatory aspect of the diaspora, the, the, the movement that never sees, uh, and the, the, but she had in mind the people, for instance, Jamaicans, 
who were moving to the USA and who were moving to the UK, right? Mm -hmm. And in, uh, I've, I've rarely so, uh, seen uh, people talking about diaspora and uh, engaging what was happening in Central uh, America or Latin America at the time. Um, and about the, the specific role played by women within the UNIA, uh, what I saw, what I perceived in your paper was this, um, this double struggle, meaning uh, women fighting characterizations and fighting uh, definitions imposed from without, from uh, you know, outside of uh, the, the, the organization and outside of, uh, uh, of, of the black people who are living in Costa Rica then, but then also trying to negotiate again a space for themselves within the, the canons that had been imposed uh, within the, 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 the black people that they were dealing with. And that happened at times because, as you pointed out, uh, those limitations of the black liberation, which was short in terms of gender uh, in, in, this total, um, uh, in this total oppression, was sometimes accepted by, 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 by those same women. So, uh, so what I was most interested in was the, um, the duplicity at all times, like the double movement, the double diasporic movement, and the double struggle uh, fighting the um, the standards opposed by the Costa Rican white, I mean, self-defined white society, and the standards Im imposed by the UNIA and uh, um, and uh, the U UNIA from within. And I think that um, the last point that I wanted to mention uh, was that it, it was also um, a double movement, I mean, simultaneity when you talk about what uh, such a column that appeared in the Negro World, the UNIA official uh, organ uh, that was published in New York and that was disseminated throughout the, the diaspora. And then the local papers and the lo local voices that were able to emerge and that sometimes uh, could contest or could um, add to the contributions that were, mm -hmm. that were sent uh, from the top down. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this uh, double movement uh, throughout uh, everything that you have described, and I think that uh, tackling the, this gen gender question, and I think that we are going to discuss this throughout uh, the whole conference, is, is um, only going to show that uh, um, the more attention one might pay to, 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 to gender, um, to, to a gender, gendered analysis, and the more complexity it, it will always add to all the, the issues that we'll have, uh, that we'll discuss. Okay, thank you. So I'll let the um, panelists, if they want, respond to um, anything that um, Mabala said about their papers, and then we'll open it up to discussion from the audience. So did you want to respond? Um, sure. I, I like how you framed, uh, I took copious notes when you were talking about these double movements, double strategies. I mean, this is what I'm trying to, I'm working out um, with this article. Um, engaging with the circulation of, of the newspapers, giving enough attention to what's happening on the ground in Costa Rica, but also continuing to keep in mind that black struggles in the Americas and larger are, you know, diasporic. There are certain kind of uh, ideas, uh, representations that black people in varying parts of the world have to confront. Um, and of course the local situation changes. So. Um, What's challenging to me is to navigate myself as when I write, um, looking at these the local situation and giving enough attention to that, and then also having enough time to think about those transnational issues um, that Garveyism and that people who are attracted to Garveyism, um, you know, are trying to work with. So, um, I, I I wrote down your your comment about the um, concept of negotiation being a very useful one um, because I think what um, a lot of the um, you know black female physicians and scientists are facing is this very complex negotiation in which um, it's hard to say what they really believe about um, gender um, as a biological concept um, when what they're facing is this negotiation over being taken seriously as scientific professionals while having to defend their character mm -hmm. and, um, and defend themselves against this charge of being unsexed at the same time. So to what extent is their you know, kind of employment of these, these kind of gender tropes um, strategic um, um, in, in, in a way um, where they're facing this double bind of having to also represent their 
their race um, and be good race women. Um, you know, it, it's hard to, it's very hard to tell in their public writing, um, you know, in their public speeches, um, to what extent they're negotiating that place um, and how they actually believe um, what they actually conceive of as um, conceive gender to be um, as a scientific concept. Um, and it, it's a little bit easier to tell with race. I mean, they seem to just reject the idea of any kind of racial difference um, entirely in terms of intellectual capacity, um, you know, biological, any kind of inherent biological difference and things like that. But the, um, the gender is a little bit more complicated because they actually have to draw on those very gender tropes to defend their, their kind of character as black women. Okay, we'll open it up. Um, I would ask that you identify yourself before you give us your questions so we know who's out there. Um, but we'll open it up for questions, conversation. Yes. Okay, so um, in thinking about this question of comparative, the comparative dimension, in a way I think that kind of goes against uh, a space, a diasporic space that I'm trying to, to look at. Um, and um, I'm not necessarily sort of thinking about uh, the Negro world as a necessarily a reflection on what's going on in the United States. I mean, it was published in Harlem, um, but the circulation of the newspaper is what I'm interested in and how women from varying locations, uh, Jamaica, other parts of the Central America and uh, the Caribbean, um, would write in J Jake Scarvey's Our Women and What They Think um, section of the paper. So to think of... Uh, I mean, and this is interesting because we, we have a lot of work that kind of firmly locates Garveyism in the United States. Um, and this is kind of how, um, uh, you know, a lot of scholarship is, is uh, conceptualizing the movement. Um, and I, my work is not, I don't really do work on the United States per se. And my interest here is perhaps it is engaging with some of these similarities. And, and, and when I was watching the first panel, there were lots of things that resonated with, um, and those papers were on the United States. There were lots of things that resonated with uh, what I see in Costa Rica. So it seems to me that there are certain transnational issues, diasporic questions, that, um, that uh, Garveyism allows people in varying sites um, to engage with. And I have not done work comparing the United States um, and Costa Rica. My work is, um, is, is really focused on sort of Costa Rica and the Central American context. Um, but I would say, too, that perhaps the issue is to kind of wrestle Garveyism out of a U.S. Um, framework and begin to think of it as it moves. You know, and by 1926, 45% of, of the UNIA chapters were located in three countries, Central America, Panama, and Cuba. Um, so I think that you know, maybe we should sort of consider how Garveyism moves and also over the years how, um, you know, after he's deported from the United States, how these other places and their ideas of Garveyism and their appropriation of Garveyism to local contexts um, can perhaps point to some shifts in the Garvey ideology over the years. Um, so that's how I'm thinking about this space. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Um. The question was about the, the kind of larger context um, that I'm placing these women in. Um, let me talk um, just a second about the kind of larger context of the project that I'm placing black women scientists um, within. Um, and that's, I, I'm really interested in tracing um, um, intellectual trends among black women in general um, around a very specific topic and its bodies. Um, in um, the period from emancipation through the kind of consolidation and challenge of Jim Crow um, and how um, black women more generally often describe these kind of these kind of racial moments. Slavery itself and then emancipation and then kind of redemption, you know, the period of um, racial redemption, um, you know, of white supremacy at the turn of the century 
country as embodied experiences. Um, if you look in the um, slave narratives, for example, um, a lot of um, the women in describing um, their experiences of slavery many decades you know, many, many decades prior, um, the things that they'll talk about is the experience of, um, of physical brutality or that they carry scars of slavery to this day. Um, or they'll remember um, um, the, kind of the period of reconstruction of, and wandering um, around looking for relatives in terms of um, very material conditions like hunger um, and things like that. Um, so I'm kind of interested in, in tracing how black women thought about bodies um, in, the, in this period. Um, and then how black women scientists and physicians specifically did so um, in ways that both um, I, I use the phrase that we're both a part of and a part from these larger intellectual trends because they are also invested in bodies in a professional context. So how are they kind of thinking about their own physicality in a way that's similar to, uh, you know, to other um, kind of um, black women in general, um, but um, they're also dealing with bodies in, a you know, in either a medical context or how are they theorizing um, or responding to biological determinism and scientific racism in a professional capacity as well. So that's the kind of larger context that I'm placing them in. Yeah. Natanya? Mm -hmm. and then. My name is Nat, again. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for both your papers. And uh, my question is for Asia, uh, and really a follow up to your question. I think if you could for us, mm -hmm. it's two questions. First, Bring us to the history of the establishment of the UNIA um, and kind of posit for us where does Garvey first get his momentum mm -hmm. for this organization? I know what you're saying. Uh -huh. Okay. And then second uh, question is you talk a lot about what Garveyism brings to Costa Rica and to Costa Rican women. But I'm interested in also hearing what the Costa Rican women bring to the UNIA and how that helps shape or hinder the female voice and female autonomy in the organization, if, mm -hmm. if you think there is such a relationship. Mm -hmm. Thanks. OK. So um, thanks, Nat, for a great question, <laughs> because that allows me to, to further highlight the centrality of Central America to the, to the, the development of the UNIA. Now, uh, Costa Rica was actually the first country that Garvey had ever visited, lived in, outside of Jamaica. Um, he arrived there, uh, worked for the United Fruit Company for a while, and then headed over to Panama and visited some other uh, Spanish-speaking uh, countries at the same time. And for me, it's this movement away from Jamaica and being in sort of U.S. Uh, run enclaves that shaped the, the development of his the ideology of Garveyism. Um, uh, so it's an important part of the story that often gets left out of sort of histories of the UNIA. Um, now, your second question was uh, what Costa Rican women bring to the UNIA, right? If they shape or hinder it. I mean, that's an interesting question um, because, you know, I, I definitely want to think about. Um, I, I don't want to, the work to come across as, as, as Costa Rican women are sort of simply just reproducing kind of the ideas of womanhood that are coming from above. And, and in this way, this is why I think that the, looking at newspapers are so important, because th those who are contributing to the Negro world and the Our Women and What They Think section um, really came from varying locations in the movement. And so I guess that, can, that allows us to think about or question, you know, where where is uh, sort of uh, can, should we continue to think about sort of Harlem as the headquarters? Um, the headquarters definitely shifted, you know, right, physical right. But not an ideological one. Exactly, exactly. Um, I don't know if everybody could hear that <laughs> physical headquarters and not necessarily an ideological one. Um, it's a it's a it's an issue that I you know I continue to think about, especially especially as the movement began to lose some of its credibility in the late 1920s, you know, after the Garvey Must Go campaign in the U.S., for instance, and the, uh, the 
the fact that this movement continued to resonate with people um, in Central America, I think, is very telling um, of its currency to them. And, and also, perhaps, <laughs> there is something about being in these US these spaces of US empire also. And maybe that will allow me to think about your question a little bit more and thinking about what are, are some of these um, uh, particular dilemmas and identities that come out of a, a US context. I mean, we have to think about the, uh, the sort of American century also and how that shapes the way people are moving, why they're coming to Costa Rica, and also some of the representations that they're facing because, you know, uh, there were racial representations that emerged out of the U.S. that definitely circulated in the larger Americas and that persons in Costa Rica might have to confront along with those local representations that were particular to Costa Rica. So I probably didn't answer your question, but <laughs> I'm engaging with it because it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's an important one and one that, I, you know, I'm continuing to think about with this article. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. There was Natasha and then here and here. Okay, gotcha. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Lightfoot and I teach here um, in the Department of History. Um, so I had a question for um, Dr. Lee first and mm -hmm. then a question for the both of you. Okay. Um, so for the question, uh, I had a question specifically about um, local Costa Ricans um, mm -hmm. and how they engage Garveyism if at all. Um, we have, you know, because um, you, you, you were very specific to, to demarcate the Garvey community as specifically West Indians abroad, those who have, you know, just migrated for mm -hmm. um, labor or whatever, uh, uh, well, labor. <laughs> That's usually the reason why they've ended there. And I was thinking that that, and you also mentioned that Costa Rica had laid a claim to whiteness that was constructed in relation to these immigrant West Indians that we can certainly challenge, obviously. Um, <laughs> Costa Rica was an exclusively white space, and that's the truth of many Spanish-speaking Caribbean and Central American places, especially in the 19th century, that they're constructing their whiteness in relationship to black migrants, mm -hmm. either from, say, Haiti or from the British West Indies. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something at work there that we need to, you know, kind of tease out. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to hear you talk more about it because I'm wondering if local, you know, Costa Ricans may have engaged Garveyism in some way, maybe even if, you know, kind of got into that diaspora community mm -hmm. and identity construction that might have been or just, you know, not strictly among the West Indian and the Greek. And right. then the second question for the both of you, I'm thinking about how, the, you know, there, there's this thread of, um, again, how to think about black women's intellectual work. Um, as, how might you see it as liberatory? Um, because that's something that we've been trying to think through in the group itself, um, in the working group. How do you, how do you see um, black women, uh, you know, thinking, public speaking, et cetera, as, you know, a space for a kind of a liberatory politics. Mm -hmm. um, but also, at, you know, we've also run into many times, <laughs> in many of our subjects, they sort of become impossible subjects that are mm -hmm. hard to really, you know, sort of follow that liberation through. We often see them, you know, mm -hmm. kind of involved mm -hmm. somehow or negotiating the same sorts of repressive um, mm -hmm. structures and ideas that, you know, their work is, especially trying to challenge. So I'm thinking of, you know, in, in your case, um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Stein, the mm -hmm. ideas about the small hands. Mm -hmm. You know, what, mm -hmm. what does that say about kind of what, what are the limits of right. the liberation that this, that this woman and others in her cohort might have been able to express? Or mm -hmm. in your case, I believe the, the ideas of, you know, the loud women in the street that these you and I a women are supposedly not. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. what's that about? So, those are my two questions, and thank you so much for what we've heard today. Thank you. Do you want to? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so the first, thank you for your questions. The first um, was to think about, um, you asked if Garveyism sort of resonated with folks who weren't West Indian, and this issue of whiteness uh, and identity in the area. and. In fact, my dissertation is a, a tale of two stories that I see being intertwined. And one um, is the making of whiteness in Costa Rica. And I, I trace that at the same time that I trace sort of West Indies becoming black in, in Costa Rica. Um, 
you know, via Garveyism, via being in United Fruit Company enclaves, and via uh, these Latin American anti-black nationalist discourses. So thank you for your question, because it allows me to ex uh, expand upon that a little bit more. And Costa Rica is a very interesting uh, nation, not only within um, Central America, but in Latin America in general. I mean, because while we can recognize that there's a relationship between whiteness and modernity for a lot of um, the governing bodies and elite of Latin America, that most places, aside from the Southern Cone, at least officially um, highlight uh, a mestizaje or a mixing or a mixed identity if under the surface of that it's still affirming whiteness as the ideal and moving towards whiteness as the uh, a way of modernizing oneself. But in Costa Rica what you have is a clear and in the archives that it's clear I'm not using this term white uh, I'm not putting this onto them. There is a specific language of white racial purity that I see over and over again in official documents. Um, and to this day, Costa Ricans continue to call themselves white. Um, uh, when I'm there, um, there's white identity continues to be the sort of normative one. And, and so Costa Rica is a different, a, a unique space for that um, because like I said most other countries sort of at least on the surface highlight um, a mixed identity so so I mean like you're pointing out this time period is important and I look at how West uh, Costa Ricans while crit, um, you know uh, proclaiming that West Indian immigration is sort of um, the downfall of the nation, et cetera, et cetera, are also maneuvering against what they see as U.S. colonialism. And so I'm thinking about uh, the ways that sort of re-articulating this whiteness, and it's, this is a particular, t I mean, there are longer uh, narratives, uh, historical narratives of Costa Rican whiteness, but I look at this time period as one in which they're kind of reinventing, reimagining this white identity in critique of this U.S. colonialism, which is making them not white. So I think of them as, I think of this time period as being a really important one where um, the United Fruit Company and the increased intervention of the United States in, you know, uh, Nicaragua, their neighbors, Panama, the Panama Canal, I think all of this is shaping both the making of both whiteness and blackness at the same time. And that's the story that I tell in this dissertation, which I'm working on now as a book project, these sort of entangled, um, the entanglements of the ra of these racial identities, and that the and how they both sort of rely on similar logics. You know, this ideal of racial purity that women are at the center, gender and respectability are, are things that are highlighted in both. Um, so yeah, your question is um, much appreciated. That's definitely something that I'm I'm interested in. I don't know if you want to go to the second part. Um, sure. Lib liberatory mm -hmm. question. You can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, no, that's that's a fantastic question, and I um, I liked um, part of how you framed it in terms of the the working group dealing with these impossible questions, mm. um, and I think that's often what I'm finding here, um, because. Um, the way that um, black female scientists are are um, are positioned um, by by other black women in particular. Uh, that's why I start with the example of a black woman, you know, kind of writing this um, compendium of notable black women who should be celebrated and who are examples um, of, you know, of racial progress and so on. Um, so uh, McKinney Stewart is held up as, as um, an example of racial liberation. Um, and she actually kind of positions herself that way because of her um, entry into a field that was um, often closed off to both, um, to both women and African Americans and particularly African-American women. Um, but what ends up being constrained is the way that she can speak publicly. Um, so I, I'm very interested in um, the extent to which you know, there is a dissonance between um, these women's um, public work and their private thought and how one goes about measuring that. Because they're facing this, this very um, real, the kind of proverbial challenge of dismantling the master's house with the master's tools, um, but also 
not dismantling a house that they're trying to gain entry into as well, right? I mean, um, so it's it's an even bigger conundrum. I mean, how how did they kind of go about attacking, um, you know? Um, biological determinism, which is very central um, to kind of medical and scientific thought on race for, you know, a, a century um, or more. Um, how do they go about attacking those things without attacking the premise of the fields in which they're central, right? Without attacking, um, you know, kind of medical and scientific professions more broadly construed um, at the same time that they're trying to argue for their entry into those fields. Um, so in, in that sense, it's um, it's a bit of a, a um, kind of impossible question. How liberatory is it um, if they're kind of using these um, if they're falling back on kind of um, gender um, tropes in, in kind of um, um, positioning themselves as um, deserving of being in these fields, it, it, yes and no. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to say because they're, I mean, it seems so obviously tactical to me, um, but it's, again, hard to measure um, the extent to which it's tactical and the extent to which they actually believe in, you know, uh, in those differences, the, the small hands, for example. Yeah. If I could just um, also add to the question about um, these maneuvers being liberatory, um, and I don't really have an answer to that, <laughs> but um, it's something that I think about, especially when we consider that Garveyism is usually written about as a radical um, ideology or tradition in black radical thought. And what we have in the instance in Costa Rica and, uh, and examples from my data is that West Indians tended to be a particular, a group of very conservative um, people. And in fact, the United Fruit Company came around to officially sanctioning the UNIA and Garveyism because it kept West Indians at work. Garvey was anti, you know, unions, anti-strike, so it kept um, West Indians uh, tied to work, and also the paying of dues kept them also tied to uh, wage labor. So Costa Rica is an interesting site to look at these um, dynamics or entanglements of conservative ideas and what we might consider radical ones. Um, and I'm not sure if I, you know, have any further reflections on whether these are liberatory politics, but I know that there's something interesting in thinking about how this tradition in black radical thought has, is sort of practiced in these ways that can be thought of as, as, as being pretty conservative. So I just think that it's an interesting sight to look at Garveyism. Okay, there were other questions. I also need to make an announcement that I think um, if you're in the back near the live feed, um, apparently if you're typing on your laptop, it's coming across the live feed. So I'll ask you to move up a little bit um, and continue typing. Okay, yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Laurel Assembly, um, and I teach at Wesleyan University in the history class. And um, I want to pick up on the comments made by Dr. Smohoro. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. close enough. enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the concept of in-betweenness, mm -hmm. right? You mentioned negotiation and then people operating in between. And I think that often when we think of people operating in between, we think of it as a loss, that you don't quite fit in, mm -hmm. that, that can, the construction. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if there's a way of conceptualizing that as people inhabiting two or more or multiple places at once, mm -hmm. and then it's not a loss, but it's a, a strength or something like that. And if that idea of inhabiting many places um, might be useful to, that contradiction of inhabiting many places, might be useful to this problem of mm -hmm. getting at people's inner lives mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. getting at the um, mm -hmm. problematic language that mm -hmm. people, that women use to talk about um, uh, about their about themselves or their community, mm -hmm. and so I'm just wondering if that might be um, and it sort of um, connects up with uh, Natasha's question. Mm -hmm. If that might be a useful space to think about in betweenness as also a political thing, because you're talking about sort of nationalism and mm -hmm. citizenship in both mm -hmm. of these papers, but also in terms of an internal mm -hmm. conceptualization that allows you to think these things be tactical but you can talk about small hands, you can talk about loud women, be critical of it, maybe believe it, and also use it tactically mm -hmm. to um, mm 
to operate in other ways. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something? OK. Uh, about the in-between, because <laughs> I used it today. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I don't, I agree with you that it can, the term can be perceived as a loss. Mm -hmm. But I think that in diaspora studies, it, um, it, I think it is interesting to see how it ties geography to history or to geography to time. So it's, it's um, as if those uh, Jamaican migrants that we spoke about today, uh, because they were uh, no longer uh, British subjects at some point and no longer parts and parcel of the, of the Costa, Rica, Costa Rican nation, mm -hmm. uh, they were in between um, two lands and in between two times, in between two histories. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, when you look at the diaspora itself, um, there is this notion of a uh, uh, challenging of, of, of histories, challenging of nations, uh, challenging of, of uh, how the way you count the time when you start counting, who moved when, where, when is one going to come back, what, does one need to come to come back? So I think that the question of loss to me is not uh, necessarily. I mean, you can be an Afrocentrist, for instance and consider that uh, the, the point of departure, Africa, whatever it is, Jamaica in that instance, has been lost and needs to be regained, or you can accept the movement. Mm -hmm. and, and we've seen that, uh, I mean, we, we've mentioned Garvey today, and we know that he went uh, uh, from Jamaica to Costa Rica, and then to Costa Rica to other Latin American countries, and then he went to Europe, and then he came back to Jamaica, and then he went to the USA. Mm -hmm. So where, when does it begin? And where will it end? Mm -hmm. So I think that it, it, it's really um, um, a problem of how we, you know, as scholars, we position ourselves uh, within this uh, theory of the diaspora. If do we need a center? Do we have multiple centers? Do we have multiple times? Do we have losses? Have we gained? Things. And I think there was a question about the contributions made uh, by Costa Rican women to the UNIA, right? Along with what the UNIA brought to Costa Rica. And, and we can also go on and on and, and think about, you know, to uh, bother what um, uh, Natalia said earlier. What is a Costa Rican to begin with? And what is this white narrative that the Costa Rican nation has chosen to develop uh, in the 19th century and, and its relationship to white, so-called white uh, Spain, uh, when it was a former colony and it was not white enough for Spain at some point? Uh, you know, I mean, from the standpoint of Europe. I'm, I hope I'm not shocking everyone. <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's what I had to say. I'll stop here. I think, don't you, get I think you said it all. I, I, <laughs> do you want to say yes, mm -hmm. I'm Imani. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought about bringing like a basket of journals to pass out in the room just uh, for future historians to make their job easier. Yes. <laughs> Dominicans is sort of as a research project. Um, it's a very complicated matter, and I think uh, you know Henry Louis Gates is trying to, <laughs> to, to, to tackle it on some levels in, in Black and Latin America. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a it's a really complicated issue. I mean there. I would suggest, I could suggest a ton of people whose work I think are interesting on it. Robin Derby, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and I can talk to you later about more people. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I'm, I, I'm hesitant to say any sort of definitive statements about how blackness in the D Dominican Republic operates. Like I have my own opinions, but I also don't do research on it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> there are some complexities there. We can chat about it. Is that, a, is that a journal in your hand, by the way? <laughs> Good to know. Um, I'm very pleased to see that. 
It is a mic. So I appreciated both papers. Um, Asia, I, just a comment. I agreed with you that there were a lot of things that resonated as you were reading this, um, with these discourses about gender that I, you know, that I hear when I think about the 19th century and the early um, 20th century. Even the discussions about race problems, I seem to find a lot in other areas of my life. Even Ida B. Wells says mm -hmm. in 1928, she's writing her autobiography, but this is why she writes it, because you need a certain sense of race pride. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very interesting. But she was also mm -hmm. a fan of the UNIA, or does she was at the same time. Mm -hmm. She was a card carrying Jews paying member. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Everybody hear that? Ida B. Wells was a card carrying, dues paying member of the UNIA. So now, yeah, on record. Mm. But I, my, my comment and question is actually for this. Mm -hmm. um, I was really intrigued by your argument that racial identity is con that black women construct racial identity through the notion of the body. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and one of the people that I think is most interesting in that regard is Anna Julie Cooper. So mm -hmm. when you read A Voice from the South, mm -hmm. there's all of these discussions of bodies doing different things, racial mm -hmm. vitality, the bo body in varying stages. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, um, and I, I have a recent article that just came out that analyzes that very particular. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering who are other folks that you sort of think um, mm -hmm. are using the body to talk about racial identity or constructions of race in particular. Mm -hmm. um. Well, um, one, the, the kind of um, broader narrative that I was doing on, on bodies at, at this stage, um, that the kind of, um, I, I'm dividing this project in, into two parts, one being on, on kind of black, uh, trends among black women more generally around um, body discourse and how they think about bodies, and then the second half on black women scientists um, and physicians more specifically. Um, the part that I'm working on in this first half is dealing a lot with the um, slave narratives right now. So I'm actually trying to very hard to get at um, um, not um, famous intellectuals at the, at the part that I'm working on, um, but on everyday thought of um, black women on on bodies and an embodied experience. Um, so that's where I'm at right now, and um, and how they um, their their um, memories of slavery are about bodies, and their uh, memories of freedom are about bodies in very different ways, um, and and. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm at right now is um, not looking at um, at famous women um, so much as um, everyday um, everyday women. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yes. That's, that's exactly it, because um, at first, you know, um, when I first kind of started working on this project, everyone was like, well, black women never talked about bodies. It's like, well, they're talking about bodies even when they're not explicitly talking about bodies. And that's why I'm trying to kind of broaden out the framework to embodied experience um, as well, um, that they don't need to be saying the word body to be talking about embodiment um, in, these, in these ways. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it's definitely a challenge. But um, you know, the, the same kind of critiques of using the slave narratives, um, the WPA slave narratives, as a um, primary source, you know, certainly um, um, affect looking at black women scientists as well too. Because I I thought about kind of going into the realm of oral history there and interviewing women who started their careers um, in a Jim Crow context and kind of getting their thoughts. Um, but the same kind of you know critiques about you know to what extent, um, you know, are they going to, um, how much can you trust oral histories um, when you're talking about really difficult issues? Um, how much um, of what they're saying um, determ is dependent on who the audience is and so on. Um, but there's also something kind of freeing about the WPA narratives in the sense that the women are so old, um, you know, are often so old that they just don't care anymore in a lot of um, in a lot of the interviews where you'll um, you'll hear them you know in some or several of the ones I've read they're like out and out in, you know kind of insulting the um, the interviewers um, and you know kind of in the way that they're talking about white people and um, and they're just sort of you know beyond caring of course they're also beyond memory in some cases too um, which also makes them problematic but um, you know I think you can be conscious of the kind of of the kind of challenges and concerns without 
abandoning them entirely. So I, I, you know, I still think they're a good source set for looking at the experiences of um, everyday women. Yeah. Can you just explain to me what you mean by the economic turn? Sure. Uh, well, I, the, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the uh, but the dinner's name, but sort of just uh, discussed or, or made mention of how there was a, it was in mentioning uh, mm -hmm. how to be well recognized that there was also a need for control within white supremacy to start from the economic mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, I, and, and, uh, I guess my understanding from that is not, we reimagine it as a purely, well, not purely, but as a primarily like mm -hmm. racialized mm -hmm. <laughs> violence act, but as mm -hmm. how this Um, I, I'll, I'll tackle um, with your question there about um, uh, what were some of the ventures you said, what were some of the kind of scientific ventures that these women were engaged in? Uh, I'm kind of casting a wide net here. I mean, I'm looking at, at medical, a variety of medical professions, but also kind of scientific professions more broadly construed. Um, so it depends kind of, the answer to your question breaks down a little bit along disciplinary lines, but also there's a chron um, chronological trajectory um, as well. Um, and one of the things that um, I found that kind of transcended chronology and, and um, um, disciplinary boundaries is that um, so many of the women, whether they were, you know, engineers or nurses, um, were keenly aware of the fact that their very professional existence challenged um, some of these biological tropes about the, um, you know, the kind of innate incapacities of um, of black people and of women. Um, so, you know, even when their work wasn't in medical, wasn't in medical science or biological science or anatomy, something like that, um, they were aware of their position as a scientific professional, um, challenging um, the expectations, um, the the. Um, the kind of biolog widespread biological belief that um, you know that women and African Americans do not have um, the um, higher order thinking skills um, that would allow them to be in those professions. So they were kind of aware of themselves as kind of a um, as, as themselves of themselves as like a biological experiment in that in that sense or a biological example. Um, and that kind of transcended um, field and chronology. I saw that all the way through the late 19th century through you know, the 1940s um, and 50s. Um, but some of the, um, uh, the women who were working in more medical professional, um, in, in more medical professions, um, including physicians and nursing, um, and 
there's a better chronology there too. You, there's actually more. There's actually a drop off in um, in black women physicians, um, and the numbers kind of shift toward nursing at the turn of the century, as opposed to actual um, doctors, um, because some of the um, the politics around the kind of hardening of of Jim Crow that there's the, you know the moment of possibility and reconstruction and then the the kind of um, the violence, uh, the violent backlash. Um, and so a lot of women go into kind of nursing fields where they, they um, the kind of expectations around gender uh, make it a little bit easier for them to get into nursing fields as well, um, around women being involved in kind of caring professions and you know domestic help and things like that. Um, but they're also, um, both nurses and, and physicians um, have to defend themselves all the time from you know attacks on their character because their involvement in bodies is very intimate, right? Um, and especially like somebody like um, McKinney Stewart, who has um, a cross-racial clientele, and she's dealing with both men and women. You know, she's not a midwife. She's de she does she has a general practice, so she's dealing with both you know um, men um, and women, um, black and white, um, and everything in between. She's dealing with bodies in a very intimate way, and not just female bodies. So she's um, the mere fact that she's in a male profession, you know, um, brings her character into question and the fact that she's, you know, the, you know, the, the kind of um, intimacy you have with a doctor um, and touch and um, some of the things um, that we that the previous panel were talking about um, is something that, you know, black women nurses and physicians had to contend with um, in, in, terms, in terms of defending their right to be in the fields that they were in. I think it's important for me to point out that the United Fruit Company in its manifestation in Limon, in the Limon area, which is the Atlantic coast of Costa Rica, um, West Indians were, were seen as a sort of privileged, and being in a privileged space, because they spoke English, um, which was the language of power. And how that looked uh, was they kind of fit into a middle ranking on the hierarchy uh, between United Fruit Company bosses and the banana plantation labor, the masses of which were coming from Nicaragua, but also from Costa Rica, other places in Costa Rica. So, I mean, this brings me back to thinking about how Costa Rican whiteness then is re-articulated in the, in the face of this United Fruit Company hierarchy that's making them not white via privileging black West Indians. Um, but. I also have to note that the time period that I'm talking about is, a, is there's an important shift because the United Fruit Company plantations on the Atlantic coast are they're divesting in those, and what's important here is that the United Fruit Company is in negotiations to make a new um, a new banana enclave on the Pacific side of the country, and this and this uh, contract negotiation brings out a lot of issues around race because part of that, like I said, the 1934 contract um, excluded black people from being employed in the new Pacific side of the country, in the new Pacific banana enclave. So you're right to point out how this, e these economic factors shape all this. Um, and there is, in Costa Rica, and just a, a larger, in thinking about the larger issue of Latin America, of Latin American, the deeper roots of Latin American anti-blackness, there seems to be this fear of a black takeover. Some call it Haitianization. I see this in some, in some documents, Africanization. I see that word a lot in the Costa Rican, uh, my Costa Rican documents. So it's, it's, it's this, this job issue, right? Economic security, it, it, there's also this sort of larger fear that once black people are in equal positions and not subordinated, that somehow that's going to turn into a black takeover. And I think within that are, are fears that a black takeover will lead to race mixing. So it comes back to this fear that integration is going to produce uh, a mixed Costa Rican nation when they see whiteness as being sort of the key to survival and the key to um, modernization. And they're very explicit about that relationship. Costa Ricans when they write. Okay, we have time for two more questions. There was one here and one here. Um, so why don't we get both questions out and then we can have the panelists respond. Okay, only two. Hello, Sorry. my name is uh, Jovan Bickerstaff. I'm a graduate student from Harvard who's here doing research. 
Um, my question is actually uh, for Dr. Stein. Mm -hmm. um, I found your, your talk very, very fascinating, and especially about the multiple kind of conundrums mm -hmm. um, these mm -hmm. black women scientists are mm -hmm. facing mm -hmm. at the time. Um, mm -hmm. The first comment slash question is, um, to what extent is there bodily discourse that can be found in the medical notes mm -hmm. from that these mm -hmm. black women are leaving? If we look kind of beyond their personal memoirs, mm -hmm. how are they engaging with bodies, mm -hmm. and especially with bodies that they're not necessarily supposed to be talking about, mm -hmm. in the way that they deal with their own kind of um, subjects? Mm -hmm. The second uh, question is about to what extent are they engaged with anthropologists in particular, mm -hmm. as they're kind of dealing with the anthropology of the black body at that period in time. And often anthropologists were looking to the medical profession to kind of debunk the racial and racist discourse that was going on at the time. Thank you. Right. Okay, and then let's get, actually there are two quick graduate mm -hmm. student questions, so let's try to get those in. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to be as, as succinct as possible with my question. I'm Imani. I'm a student in English and Complex here at Columbia. Uh, my question is for Asia, Dr. Lee. I want to go back to this idea of black women's bodies, this, this paradoxical conceptualization of black women's bodies as both um, a site of demoralization and redemption. Because to me, this, this also goes back to um, ways in which the diaspora or diasporic experience has been talked about mm -hmm. as um, something potentially demoralizing, but uh, demoralizing, but which also gives birth to redemptive citizens, um, mm -hmm. as you talked about in your talk. I just mm -hmm. thought the first uh, verse of Bob Marley's redemption song popped into my head as you were speaking, mm -hmm. um, and the first verse is about the middle passage, mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering how. Um, this discourse, um, how that becomes gendered in a way, um, and what we do with that. I'm not sure what we do with that. And how this um, may have found this way into discourses of um, redemptive motherhood that you talk about. Mm -hmm. Okay, and your final. Yeah. Um, I'm JT um, Rowan. I'm a student in history here. My question is for uh, Dr. Stein. Mm -hmm. Really, uh, really quickly, I'm, I'm wondering if you could have considered um, the 1910 uh, Flexner Report and its relationship with um, the, the Rockefeller Report, which in sort of traditional uh, historiography of American medicine and, sort of, mm -hmm. and Canadian medicine is sort of the moment in which um, sort of bio, biomedicine trumps all of the sort of other, mm -hmm. uh, other, other possibilities. And so I'm wondering if, if we're, and at the end of the day, this, the Flexner Report closed a large number of Black um, hospitals, and particularly black teaching hospitals, um, with with important ramifications for black health. But but part of the justification for closing them was their improper facilities and their sort of um, their their not they weren't adhering to certain bi lines of pro uh, proper mm -hmm. biomedicine. And so I'm just wondering if there's a relationship between what black women physicians and scientists, but physicians in particular, able to articulate mm -hmm. around um, mm -hmm. around gender, race, and the body, and this sort of 1910 closing of other certain mm -hmm. possibilities. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, to answer Imani's question, mm -hmm. um, this issue around the woman's body being both the site of demoralization and perhaps the site of redemption. And I think that brings me to sort of thinking about, or rather to highlight the fact that there are, I think there are many ways to harness and utilize diaspora and write diaspora and make it. Um, and I think here what I'm thinking about is what redemptive diaspora looks like. Mm -hmm. you know, and and I'm, I'm sure there are many other kind of ways to utilize diaspora that don't necessarily have to take on these um, qualities that uh, those who followed Garveyism did. I think it's just sort of one example of how perhaps diaspora was utilized um, in both local and, and transnational space. I mean, you're right to point out that 
the body is central here, even in, in the story, in um, the making of, of a redemptive woman, and in the making of redemptive um, motherhood. You know, this is there's this fear of of racial extinction that also plays a role, plays a part in these archives that I see again and again, the future, their survival of the race. These words are used a lot. And so if we think about that and take that as a serious concern of, of those who were writing at the time, you can, it's, I can see the move towards wanting to highlight and put forth certain times, types of black motherhood. If, the, if survival is key and extinction is something that you feel is a possibility for the future, mm -hmm. there's this emphasis on a certain type of reproduction, mm -hmm. which lends itself to a very specific idea of what a redeeming black motherhood is. So I think you're you know, right to point out this, that the body is both <laughs> potentially the site of moral corruption mm -hmm. Uh, and also a site, if we discipline it enough, to, to produce redemptive uh, children, you know, the future Garveyites of tomorrow, which is, is how a lot of uh, women sort of conceptualize their role as mothers in the, in the newspapers. Um, okay. Um. See, a lot of, lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> uh, but I also wrote down a lot of what was just said because um, what, what the questions actually helped me do um, is one of the things that I was talking about in the paper is about um, kind of thinking broadly about the kind of source sets I use. Um, and that's been the kind of challenge um, of this project as I've been developing it. Um, and you both gave me um, great leads um, on some additional source sets to use um, in kind of getting at these questions. Um, so let me tackle the first one about the medical notes. Um, and, and I kind of perceived that to mean like clinical notes, um, looking at black women's um, kind of um, clinical records of how they're talking about the bodies they treat. Um, I think that's actually a great, um, a, a great possibility. I think that would be fantastic um, to get at how they talk about bodies in general. Um, I'm not entirely sure how to get at those sources, though. Um, um, I, that's something I'm going to have to look into. Um, what, one of the things that I have looked at is their, their kind of um, published articles and medical journals. Um, and one of the things, um, one of the trends that kind of emerges in there um, is the way that they talk about um, um, the kind of um, the medical ailments that they treat their um, black um, patients in particular for um, as being not so much indicative of biological differences between the races, but the embodiment of racism. Um, so they'll talk about, um, in very explicit terms, about like health disparities um, without perhaps actually using that term, but um, the, the kind of manifestations of poverty, for example, that, um, that they're having, to, the, the kind of medical um, manifestations of poverty or poor nutrition that they're um, dealing with in their clientele, um, for example. Um, so that, that's something that they're talking about in, in kind of published medical articles um, rather than you know the um, biological differences that make one race susceptible to a disease you know, to one disease over another, which is very common in white kind of racial, like scientific work on um, race in this time period. Um, so they're kind of looking at environmental issues um, around um, race and disease in a way that um, white scientists aren't necessarily at the same time. Um, the um, other question was about um, oh, their engagement with anthropology, um, and um, I, I would take it back to even ethnology too, um, and um, ethnology being kind of the like polyglot, um, you know, sciences of race in the 19th century um, versus the the kind of cultural anthropology I think you were describing in the early 20th century. Um, so part of, I mean, the, my answer to the question kind of depends on what time period I'm looking at um, in terms of how much they're engaged with it. Um, to some extent, they're um, they're taking on ethnology, the, the kind of more um, biologically based um, discussions of, of race um, and, and kind of adopting or, or um, engaging in a more positive way with cultural anthropology and the, and the kind of uh, models of race that that offers. Um, and that's where the, the kind of environmental um, discussions of health that I was just talking about um, kind of come in. So I think it depends on, on the time period there. Um, 
The uh, other question, oh, about 1910 as being kind of a um, pivot point. Um, I, I actually had not thought about that. Um, I just wrote down um, um, exactly what you said. Um, but I think, um, you know, to look into further. Um, but um, the, the closing of the kind of um, public clinics that you're, that you're talking about um, is, is actually an interesting example because one of the things that a lot of black women physicians, um, and actually black male physicians for that matter, um, kind of complain about um, is their inability um, to um, to actually even work in some of those clinics, um, e you know, even with black patients, you know, that as black physicians, they're often, um, they're often um, cut out of a um, access to hospital facilities. They often have to fall back on, on private practice um, because they're um, barred from a lot of hospital clinics, even ones that um, primarily serve a black population. So that's a very common complaint. So then if something goes wrong with one of their patients, if they lose a patient, it's often blamed on them being bl um, bad doctors when they don't actually have access to hospital facilities, um, you know, where they might get a consultation from another doctor or a specialist, or have you know, kind of more medical resources available to them. Yeah, so I think that's actually a really good point. I wrote it down. Yeah. Okay, let's thank, thank this wonderful panel. Mm -hmm. So I'm inviting you to join us upstairs for a reception. I also have another announcement. Um, Evelyn Higginbotham has been stuck in the airport all day long, and she's not going to make it. So we will not be having her as our Zora Neale Hurston um, speaker tonight. So join us, have a glass of wine, get the list of restaurants, go out and have a great dinner, and then be back early tomorrow morning at 8.45. We have a full day of wonderful panels. Thank you.